Okay, so you've got that piece of paper underneath there. Now, if you put a little hole in this and just get some suitcase scales, simple as that, put suitcase scales through that hole, and have a go at pulling it. As long as you get 10 kg. Mm. Oh, yeah, fuck okay. that. As long as you've got 10 kg, you've got a really good bond. Yeah? Okay. That's all you need to know. Okay? So that's basically on a, a surface where you're not sure. Obviously, if it's a if new board, you'll be fine. Sure, yeah, if, if you've got some doubts on it, whether it's going to stick or not, yeah. especially with PVCs and, and DPDMs, you yeah. know, apply the primer if it calls for it in the book and do a peel test. But that's basically how you do a peel yeah. test. Okay. You know, or a decent test, depending on how you want to call it. So, all I'm doing is check it's all right. Uh, get some sandpaper on there if needs to be. Some sandpaper on the table there, a little bit sticking up. Anything like that, just flat them off. But as long as you're happy with the rest of it, I'm doing the quick stand up on these edges here by using the uh, by using the tissue on there, you've got the nice and smooth anyway, ain't you? Yeah. Do we have to wipe it? Was that stone? That's stone before this. Final it depends coat. how long, right? So, so right now, same day, all you need to do is stand up and wipe down. Okay. Yeah. Wipe down with that stone, get the dust off it. Yeah. Up to seven days, yeah, one day to seven days, I sit on wipe the whole lot because okay. crap up full out of yeah. the sky. Yeah. From seven days to 14 days, you're going to sandpaper everything, okay. the whole lot, and then ash it on white, like you do with conventional. Yeah. yeah. After 14 days, unfortunately, you've got to start all over again. Don't strip it off, just sandpaper, oh. ash it on white, and just apply the mat again. Uh -huh. That's all you need to do. Don't take everything off, just leave it. Yeah. Sand it up, make it good, apply the mat. Yeah. With a conventional, it's within 24 hours to get your top coat on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, all top coats tend to fail be conventional because they've not been prepped properly. When you put your base layer down, once it's gone off, and you paddle rolled it and everything else, you're supposed to sand it, acetone wipe it, leave it half an hour for the acetone, up to an hour sometimes, depending on how cold it is, for the acetone to dissipate, yeah? And then apply your top coat. If you don't, and lots of people don't, they put the base layer down, put top coat on. It looks all right, mm. but the base coat brings waxes to the top. And as soon as that heat gets onto that wax, it, it turns the wax back into gel, and it basically cracks up and that's why your top layer starts flaking off. Most conventional roofs, if you go back to them, the base, care, base layer is not too bad, mm. yeah? But the top layer is just flaking off, yeah? If you're gonna replace that, what you have to do is get all the loose stuff off there, sand it down, get back to base layers mm. as close as you can, so you've got a good solid substrate, and then you can put our system on top of it. That's the system, not just top coat, mm -hmm. the whole system, the fiberglass, resin, the whole lot. Don't just top coat it again because mm -hmm. it won't fall off again. Okay. okay, so top coat on this. You can see we've got fibres in this. You can see the fibres in there. They're all gone curly. Yeah, all we're going to do is make sure we get <coughs> enough resin in there and the vertical. Is that one still standing on its end? Can we come back with that one still vertical? The corner, the far corner rig? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because exactly. you were asking, you know, how, how long will it stand upwards? Yeah. Well, I'll answer that question for you. <laughs> it's been stood down now, so you can't see it. <coughs> don't apply too much. If you are doing vertical with this, don't apply too much to the vertical. You know, build it up in sections. You know, don't be too mad with it. But make sure you get plenty of resin to bring it through the mat. Yeah? <coughs> but don't go overboard like you would on the roof. Yeah? Do it exactly the same as you would with the verticals. Mm -hmm. But obviously you can't wet the sides out like you can with the corner pieces. You should never hold it in place. Just make sure you get plenty on the vertical. Enough to cover it without it slumping. Get your mat into it and roll it into the vertical. Yeah? Okay. Half a litre per metre. So, get plenty on to start with. Yeah? Try not to build it all in one area. Yeah? Just drop it in various areas all over there and get a nice good coverage on it. Yeah? Now, if you put too much on for whatever reason, that's the intonation because if you put too much on, let's say you put a massive amount on that in there, yeah, all you're doing is rolling it out, get it more or less equal all the way through. And if you put too much in one area, you can just drag it from there and pull it through and put it somewhere else, yeah. Now, when you're actually putting your top coat on, there's no problem rolling, pouring it onto it because you can see it, but never ever do it pour for your base coat because you need to apply it and get the right amount underneath it. With this, you can actually see, so if it's ever in one area and pour too much in there, you can drag it from there, put it over there, yeah? Your verticals, while your roll is wet but not saturated. Oh. 
you've got a nice thin coat on there to start with, all you're doing is supplementing that with another bit on top. Now you'll see it's a different colour, A because it's glossy for starters, but the other reason is when you put your base coat down it took the actual styrene out of the fiberglass mat which is white, so it dilutes the colour so it's a lighter grey. So you can see the difference between the actual top coat and base coat even when it's gone off mm -hmm. because it would just be a different colour grey. So don't go mad with it, you can cover it, not smother it, but make sure you get every bit covered, make sure there's no bits left uncovered. And just with a bit of care on there, bring it forward, hold the heavy stuff, bring it to the front. But your final roll, once you've actually got that in place with a big nine inch roller, your final roll basically just start at the back there, no weight on your roller, just roll it to the front, take it off the edge, make sure you've got no runs. Overlap your roller quarter, yeah, and then bring it one direction. You're rolling it this way because you can't see it very well unless you really look at it carefully. As you're rolling it, your resin's dropping in one direction. If you roll backwards or forwards, you like to see stripes in it, yeah, so just make sure you roll it all in one direction to start with. No weight on your roller, you see this? Make sure just the weight of the roller. If it's a nine inch roller on a staff, the ratio is exactly the same as just the weight of this without a staff, yeah. And then just over the front, make sure it no runs in there. Keep an eye on it for a while because you might get a few runs. If you've got a decent pitch on the roof, it might slump down a little bit. So just keep an eye on that front edge. Okay, once you've done that, we're all good to go. <coughs> Yeah, okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. So key benefits can be applied to almost any surface, including fell, ash fell, concrete, yeah, GRP, PVC, single plies, yeah, T and G4, talking about grooving metals. So yeah, there's not much there that it won't go on to. And all of them are described on there, yeah. Okay, totally seamless, so you have got seams in there somewhere. Yeah, all around the perimeters, it seems in there like they're all hidden now, aren't they? They've all got, yeah. Once they actually come together, 50ml lap, that's all it is, 50ml lap, consolidate it, and it becomes one piece. And once it's gone off, once it's cured, it's called a membrane, yeah. So it's no longer a fiberglass roof, it's a membrane roof, liquid membrane roof. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay, uh, fully tap fire tester, so BS473, 4763, uh, FAA, B roof T4. You know, everything's there for it. European numbers, EN numbers 13, no 5, stroke 4. Yeah, so everything's there for your fire rating. Now, if you don't believe me, I've always said take your models with me, with you when you've done today, uh, and build a bonfire one. And you just set fire to the bonfire in the middle of it. And just see what happens to it. Yeah. That will stay where it is. The timber underneath will scorch and burn away. Yeah, but your roof will predominantly stay in one piece, it won't spread, it won't go over it. If it does burn, it'll just burn the lump to that area, you won't get fire spread. So for that reason, it's unrestricted use, you can use it anywhere, on any surface, on any building you want. Yeah? It's local authority approved, so that's what LABC is. So, certificate number's there, so if you are working for local councils, there's your number you're going to use to actually quote for any of your work. I'm using RESTEC 2070 system, local authority approved certificate number such and such. Yeah? Okay? Uh, rapid installation, so we did this morning, I went for a cup of tea, it's gone off, so you can put your coat on, so you can get your base coat before dinner, come back after dinner, put flirt on, put top coat on, top coat goes on that, literally that easy. Mm. Yeah, okay with that? Okay, 225 mat, so you're not using a big heavy mat, you don't need a heavy mat with it. However, if you want to use 450 or 600 gram mat, you can use it, no problem, I'm not going to restrict you, but you're going to spend a lot of time bringing that resin through, you've got to get a shitload of resin underneath it. That's a technical term, by the way, shit. Mm -hmm. Lots of resin underneath there and bring it through. So it's just not worth it. It's tested and approved certification with 225 mats, so why actually go deeper? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do 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 do. Uh, train installers. So after today, you can call yourself a train installers. Yeah, you get out there and get plenty laid. There's a whole pallet of stuff just outside your doorway, so if you want to take it with you today, it's still there for it to take away. Okay, um, anti slip finish, just showed you that one. You okay with that? That's, that's gone off, it's rock hard already, so all done. Yeah, okay. Uh, super application of temperatures down to one degree, or explained. 
Yeah, the resin itself, standard range, five to thirty. We can extend it. We can take it down to it using the additive. Yeah, don't put different resin together and never actually mess about with the actual catalyst mixture, thinking it'll make it go off quicker. Which, if you do, that's what I'll have with that resin this morning. Uh, ISO, so ISO is basically it does what it said on the tin, apply it correctly. Well, today you've learned how to apply it correctly, take that forward, you shouldn't have any problems at all with your job. Yeah, okay. Uh, do single resin system, repaired, overcoated, yeah, it will look okay. Yeah, okay, flicking over a page. So, uh, page four. A bit of a checklist there. If you've got a scanner uh, in your office or whatever, scan it, expand it, laminate it, stick it on the back of your door. Maybe van. Because everything there you may need. You don't need everything on there, but you may need it. It should be a point. So when you went to a site, right, I went to a site, I've got I've got this, I've got this, and you get to site and you forgot your catalyst. Well you might as well just turn around and back up because you can't work without a catalyst, yeah. Don't forget when you're buying your mat, make sure you've got all your mat laid out so all you've got you've got all your mat you're gonna need so you don't have to mess about Running back and forward buying a map because you've already set it out, you know it's there and it's in a bag inside. You marked up one to twenty, whatever it is, yeah, you're okay with it, okay. Even down to photonometer for checking the moisture, showed you that this morning. Temperature gauge, rags, definitely the same, just taking rags with it. Everything on that list you may need, okay. Okay, flicking up page five, assessing the existing roof. Now, not when you go into assessment too much, but I assessed one this morning, didn't I? Yeah, you walk on the roof, you fall through it, it's totally knackered, you can't repair it with this, whatever. But if it's sound, all your joints are pretty good, your trims might need shit, might look crap, so cut your trims off, cut your board out. Which one had uh, the felt on it? Yours, weren't it? Mm. Basically, cut all your trims off, get rid of them, put new trims onto it, yeah, prime on top of the existing roof and cover it over. It all intents and purposes, it looks like a new roof. If your roof underneath it's bumpy and lumpy and that, then it's going to show through. So be careful on that one. It will still carry a 20 year warranty if you put it down right. But your client might not be very happy if it looks exactly the same as the roof they just had replaced. Yeah, if it's got a bump there, well, the bump's still there. Yeah, because I'll just overcooked it. Yeah, how, I'll do a new roof. How clean would an old felt roof have to be? You need to because jet wash it. Yeah. Jet wash it, don't leave any crack in there at all. Yeah, jet wash it, get as clean as possible you can. Stiff brush it, jet wash it. Let it dry, totally dry. Don't ever put anything down wet. That's what you're putting on it just for, just make sure you've got moisture into it. So, where is it? It's on that table there. It's that orange, yeah, orange machine. Yeah. yeah, grab that. Find something wet. Find something with moisture in. What we've got with moisture in? Local. How about your arm? <laughs> there we go. You'll be glad to know that you're not dead. Okay. Give so, me a Yeah. Just, just all it does is check electrical resistance across there. Obviously, if it's wet, it travels through it. If it's bone dry, yeah, then we've got 0.8 in there. Now, if you get 0.20%, if it's just a slight moisture in the actual uh, timber itself, because nothing's 100% dead dry, mm. otherwise, it just turned to dust, wouldn't it? Yeah. What's the tolerance of that? 20%, 20% moisture. That's, yeah. In the actual timber itself, not on the top of it, and that's not 20 ml of water on top of it, that's 30%. <laughs> okay? So there will be a slight moisture, um, in, no, even no, a brand new board that's been in the warehouse for ages, there will be a slight moisture into it. I don't think we'll have to get it out if that's the case if there's 20 ml of water on top. Yeah, we have a job to make it fit because you need to float on top of it. Okay. Right, now talking water. Once we've actually laminated all this, provided there's no white fibre showing and it rained on that first base coat, yeah, just leave it. Yeah, let it rain onto it, don't worry about it. And when it stops raining, you'll find that it's cured underneath the water. Mm -hmm. Not like your conventional stuff, it don't turn to white mush and throw it away. So if you're working with it and you think to yourself, hang on, there's a rain cloud coming over, I can feel spitting it here. Any fiberglass mat you've got exposed, cut it out, put it in a bag, get it off the roof quick, and then laminate your sides it. Just close it all off. And if it rains on it, depending on how heavy it rains, it might leave the pot marks in the roof because the craters it eats it hard. Yeah. Well, before you put your top coat on, just sand it off. Yeah, just get it flat, like we did with all these rigs, and then put your top coat on. Now, if it rains on your top coat, that's a problem because you will leave pot marks, so your client won't see them. Yeah, it'll <coughs> sand it all down and reapply. Sand it, ask don't wipe, reapply within 24 hours if possible. To make sure you get that good bond. Okay, okay. But like I say, between the coats, between that base coat and your top coat, you've got there about seven days just by a stone wiping. Okay, storage. 
Yeah, mention storage, try and keep it at 15 degrees. If you take it onto the roof, cover it over, keep them cans cool. It's no use having a, a tin that's 40 degrees, put it onto a, a surface that's 10 degrees, because it's a massive imbalance. And you'll be actually setting your catalyst to suit surface temperature. And as soon as you put your catalyst in a tin at 40 degrees, yeah, it'll be going off as you're mixing it. So keep your temperatures down in your tins. Cover them over, put a bit of white tie over there, just keep the sun off them. Better still, don't take them onto the roof until you actually need them. Yeah. Okay. Plan your installation. So <coughs> plan your installation. Don't feed yourself up. Yeah, you know, I'm going to start here and around here and I'm fucking blocked in. Yeah. Don't start walking. Just get half an hour. That's all you need. You walk off the roof. Don't there. Yeah. But don't don't block yourself into a corner. And also think about it. UV light sets fiberglass off quicker. Yeah. So if you're working in a really sunny area and it's shaded around the corner, go around the corner and shade that area. Work in that area and work towards the shade if you can. If you've got some sand tops, click onto the fascia board and bloody hang it to the scaffold at the back. Just keep yourself in shade. Not just for this, for yourself as well. Keep yourself in shade otherwise you're going to get fatigued. Yeah. I mean, we put the additive into this at 30 degrees, but if you've ever worked on the roof at 30 degrees, you're flagging. You really does get to you. You start, you know, you start going gaga with it. But there's times when you can't, Avoid you have to work at them you just got to get done because that's what the answer is for. Yeah? You'll see later on in the book, it comes to add this with a big red cross after 30. Okay, users fighting against. So if anybody came into here and said, right, I want to use this stuff, and suppose these guys have told you exactly the same. Yeah, I want to use 2020. Really need training. Yeah? And I'm hoping that's what, what the guys told you when you came in. What's this? Can I use it? Yeah, you can buy it, but you need training. Yeah? So you've done your training, you get a certification, and that's give you an open hand on anybody else. Because most merchants will actually sell it anyway. You can buy it on the internet as well, so one or two merchants sell online. Yeah, but there'll be no warranties with it. You have got the access to the warranty now, which nobody else can actually achieve. Okay. Okay, clicking over, flat roof detail guidance. Yeah, that little chapter three there could actually go on for the rest of the book because there's so much guidance on flat roofing, but really what you remember is 150 up stands. Make sure you've got a good fall into roof, one in 80 falls if possible. And if you're buying furry strips for your timber, they're already set at 180. So yeah, you should be okay with that. If you're doing a balcony and you've got to put a slight fall into it, it's best to have a slight fall in your roof. Yeah, because when you put your patio table on there and your glass on there, a 180 fall is not going to make your glass slide off the table. Yeah, but it will actually get all the water off the roof. Okay, you'll not notice it. One in eight on the roof, sat on the table, getting pisses apart. Yeah. You're, you're not okay, there's 184 in there. Okay. Okay, but the benefit is if you drop that bottle on the table, on the top, or drop, drop a glass on it, it's not going to break very easy, is it, mate? <laughs> <laughs> no, fucking hit it. <laughs> okay, just take some breaking through. Okay, drying the roof. Make sure your roof's dry. Picture of a pentameter. Clicking over a page. We've got now on page seven, we've got three pages now dedicated to what this will go on to and does it need a primer? Okay, so you see first four, four, first, first four photos there. Roof chippings, it can't want that. Common sense, really. Solar reflective paint, again, it can't go on top of that. The whole idea of putting solar reflective paint is stops from sticking and reflect it away. But after about four years, it goes black and it's just as bad as blue stuff that's already there anyway. So. Uh, loosely adhered membranes, so if you've got uh, PVC or EPDM that's like that, yeah, would you try and go over the top of that? I mean, if it's that bad, you really got to pull it off and assess what's below it, because your roof underneath it could be rotten, because it's been like that for several several weeks, several years. Yeah, something, something somewhere is wrong, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, moss vegetation and growth. Yeah, again, you mentioned about it, how things it needs to be. Get wash it, get nice and clean. If you're on a felt roof, jet wash over the laps, not into the laps, otherwise you'll be pushing water into it. And it's common sense, but not the anyway. Okay, so felt roof, yeah. <coughs> right at the bottom there, it says primary required. 2020 primary when we use the white one. Yeah, okay. Picking over a page, ash felt roof. So if you've got cracks in that ash felt roof, a Kiltex fills all them cracks in, yeah. If you've got a blowhole in the roof, that's come by the fact that the ash felt in that area is quite thin. Moisture is finding itself in that area, it's super heated because it's black and it's basically forming a big steam bubble underneath it. So really you need to break that out, smash it out, use the leveling compound, just get it nice and flat. But, somewhere on that roof there were some little chimney vents that were put in when the asphalt was put down. Now them asphalt chimney vents, uh, although you might think it's redundant now, but they're actually kicking back in again. They put them vents down generally every 10 metres to allow the asphalt because there's hot ash going onto there 
and the old concrete roofs we used to do it on used to put bitumous primer down there, hesse and sag, and then trowel the asphalt onto it, you know, really thick stuff on top of it. Yeah. Well, that hesse and sag was like a breathing membrane to allow moisture to move around underneath it, and then little chimney vents to allow that moisture around with the roof. Yeah. So now them chimneys are really kicking back in again. Now, so many times I've been to jobs and I've done it myself. You want to a roof now, you don't need that anymore. Kick it off, level it off, fill it with cement, and just straight over the top of it. What you're doing, you trap that moisture into it. So how's it going to get out now? It's just going to form a blister or a bubble underneath your roof. So if you've got chimney vents in there, reinstate them. If they look a bit crappy, put a bit of plastic pipe over the top of them, just to make them look like they should be. They push them on top of that. Yeah. Fill your cracks in with acrylic text, and basically you just put primer straight over the whole lot of it and cover it all in. Okay. <coughs> Okay. Okay, GRP roof. So the top picture on the GRP roof, top top coat flaking off. Yeah. So that's the most common problem you get with it. You've got to get all that loose stuff off, sand it down, and apply our system on top of it. But you don't need a primer because it's GRP or to GRP. Okay. So we just sand it down all nice and simply. Okay. Concrete brickwork screed. Yeah. So brickwork off the wall. Yeah. No problem doing that. If you're going way up the wall, think about you know how you how you're going. And you get a bit of slumping in it, you know. But I did turn the model on its side here and we turned it back down again. Yeah. I turned it up there for a reason so you guys could see, even though it's that deep, it's not moved anyway, it's not moved anyway because you've uh, put it down right. Okay, so if you're going out to concrete, it's a tricky one because your client will put a new concrete roof on the roof on, on the top there and they'll say, Well, I've walked on it last week and it's time enough that I can walk on that, but it's not hydrated. Concrete's got to hydrate. You know, concrete don't dry, it's a chemical reaction with the cement and the lime and everything that's in there and that moisture will be trapped into that concrete for about a month. So, depending whose latch of concrete it is, get in touch with that concrete supplier and ask them what the hydration period for the roof is for the concrete and they'll tell you generally it's 28 days. So really you don't put anything on there 28 days. If you've ever done latex floors in, in, in patches and such as that, they won't put that down until your concrete's been down 28 days because the moisture will get underneath it and basically just find it way to the top. As soon as the sun gets onto there, create heat and basically start bubbling up underneath, okay? Which is always a tricky one, because your client will drive your car on it, after the car and put my roof on it. Well, your car is not going to stop hydration, yeah? But putting this on, because you're not vapor permeable, it will, yeah? Okay? Okie dokie! <coughs> just chucking a twist on that one, actually. If you put concrete onto a metal deck, Corrugated metal deck, you put, how long do you think con, uh, the hydration period is? Eh? Twice as long. Yeah? Yeah? Because it's only hydration because it can't just, just spend time. Yeah? So if you've got a metal deck, then you've got a rate problem with the client. Yeah? Okay. Uh, single ply membranes. Yeah, I've done that one, sorry. Right, uh, metals. So if you're going for metal, we have, uh, we have got a big primer for metal. It comes in the 5 kg with the catalyst and mixed into it and paints it online. Yeah, so get rid of the rust, treat the rust, apply the primer and put our system onto it, yeah. If it's galvanised, brand new galvanised gutter, it will have machine oil in there for all the bending and cutting. Acetone wipe it, yeah, get all the machine oil off, metal prime it, yeah. If you're on to aluminium, aluminium trims and it's like, you get stucco finish with like an emboss finish or mill finish with like brush finish, that aluminium will have a lacquer on top of it to stop it oxidising and turn to white rot, yeah. Sand that off, metal primer, put our system onto it. Yeah, lead gutters. We mentioned about lead earlier. Yeah? Yes, lead, lead work. Clean all the crap off there. Now, when that lead was put down, depending on when it was, it had patination boil onto it, um, which got into the pores and actually sealed itself in. Yeah, so you need to get it down to shiny metal. Yeah, then abrade it roughly so it's got some kind of key and apply a metal primer to that. Okay, okay, clicking over. So page, page uh, 18, TG boards, I've explained all that this morning, don't need to go through that again, you okay with that? Yeah. Okay, flicking off the page from that one, page 11, uh, picture with the green lines on it, it's basic straight cut boards, I'll explain that by putting tape and bandage on it, you okay with that? <coughs> okay, flicking over again, all the different trims we do, yeah, so you use, today you've used a drip trim, upstand fascia, you've used a wall fillet, you've not used a corner piece, although we do supply them, but you've made your own corners, so what's, what's up with the corners you've made? Mm -hmm. they, you know, yeah, you can buy them, but not your own. If our sales guy were here today, I'd say buy the corners because it makes life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. 
and abolish you some more money and fucking more work for you. You've still got to put the corners together, you've still got land laying around them to see later in both. So, you know, why make your own? Take a bit of care, make sure they're nailed up and you'll be alright with it. Okay? A uh, couple of flashings for the trim. So, we've got like lead chase flashings. So, if it's, uh, if it's a roof where you can get them too easy, use a couple of flashings. Because if it's lead, I know it's light around here, but where I've been stoked. You put it on one day, and as soon as you leave sight, somebody will be on the roof ripping the fucking lead off again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you use that one, I mean, I, I love putting lead in. I think it just looks more professional with a nice lead trim. But if it's somewhere you can get to it, it's pointless doing it because you just get nicked. So, yeah. would you use a uh, lead seal as well on a lead? Yeah, on yeah. This? just fit like you would with lead. Mm. Two into all, fit in with stainless steel slugs to make sure it stays yeah. in place and the lead makes it in. Yeah. Okay, don't forget when you're actually doing your chase, 10 mil above that flash until the mm -hmm. expansion will be moving. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and on a corners, you would have to sort of resin it, mold it, wouldn't you? Or you have a corner trim uh, where you've got internal, yeah. external, yeah. internal, well, external. Yeah, you've done that. We'll just do the same thing, yeah? Yeah, it's okay. just the same thing. No difference with it. So if okay. you were making like a fiberglass box, you'd yeah. have to put edging uh, trim. 90 degree angle. Over the edges, where it goes over. Yeah, go yeah. We, we, we do a 90 degree bend uh, yeah. flash, flashing. They've got to be stick it stock here. Yeah. Just 90 degree. It's easy then trying to get it over the top because as soon as you start ticking over the top, it'll stand out a little bit yes. on that corner. Yeah. yeah. You can get away with it, but make sure you put the bandage down there first because the bandage will actually follow the con contour of the shape. Yeah. And then you can take the fiberglass off there because the, the fiberglass will stick to the bandage easier. Yeah. Straight onto timber, bare timber. It will tend to try and puff itself out behind it. So it doesn't look as good, but it still is, works as well. But yeah. Not as good as the trim, the look. Yeah. Well, yeah. I said, there's some in it. I mean, this is just a small selection of trims we do. Yeah. In the back of this book, you see this. Come on. Rofer Sporn by a magazine. Huh? Rofer Sporn there. Yeah. Trees. There we go. That's, that's, that's more than <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah
plane it down if you want to put a rebate so you don't get this build up, mm -hmm. yeah? And then fix your timber from above, below, whichever way you want to do it. And then the whole lot then will expand in one piece mm -hmm. rather than pushing against the facial board like it's showing there, yeah? Everything, everything that's on here is a, a true picture, an actual picture, but that is Photoshop by somebody four year old working with the etch sketch I think, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, the bottom two pictures, yeah, pre-made corner pieces, fixed into place, mitres into the corner, it's still taped over the top, mm. so you know, that's about it, yeah. Okay, wall, wall fillets with the wall, yeah, never fix the vertical, always fix the deck, allow for the expansion and movement behind it, okay. Flat plate, if you're going to put a lay board on a flat roof, flat board to slide the slate to the roof, so you can put flat plate on the back of there, but you can get away with the fiberglass as well, but where it changes angle onto your flat board, Bandage, any detail change, anything like that, bandage first and then take your fiber glass over it. Okay? Okay, nope. Expansion joints again, mentioned about that one. They're on three meter length, but you can use them for decorative expansion as well. And if you look in the book here, we've actually got smaller ones that look like uh, Vin Zinc. You've got all seen zinc roofs in the dark grey, same colour as this. We've got little small ones that look like a standing sink type thing. Yeah? Okay, uh, page 17. Yeah? We're on about your, your, your primer now. So you can see here we've got all the different uh, ratios, but you don't have to worry about that because it's all on the back of the tin. Yeah? Clicking over a page. So you've got a picture at the top there with a bloke throwing some uh, catalyst into a bucket and mixing it together. Primer, make sure you, when you put your primer on, don't miss anything at all. Because if you get black patches on the roof, it's because you haven't skimped with the primer. The bitumen will migrate, it's called pollen migration, it migrates from an inert object like your fiberglass which will have gone off but it still migrates in there. Now you've all witnessed, probably indirectly, polymer migration. If you've ever used any coloured silicones of any kind against a bitumen surface, yeah, and the coloured silicon starts going brown, brittle, and that's the bitumen actually migrating. Even though the silicon is set and the bitumen is set, it carries on working. It's just a chemical reaction between the two. Or pollen migration, that's what happens to your roof, you need to grind it down. Okay, okay, bottom three pictures, pipe detail, see that being done? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. yeah, joints on your trim. We're going to mention joints on your trim, the base time doing it, put a joint on that, but exactly the same tape, same as you've done in your corners, double tape and tissue if you want to. That bit of tissue on there you put on there, that's made that totally different, hasn't it? Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, and square cut boards, add to the square cut board, masking tape, bandage, primer, yeah? Clicking over a page, a page, uh, page we're to 19, okay? Little bar chart on top of there, <coughs> one degree, below one degree you can't use it, but five degrees to, fit, to 30 is your normal temperature range. The big red X after 30, that's basic for your information. We have got an active ticket over there, but when you get to 30 degrees, we advise just knock it on the head, because it's going to go off so fucking quick, it's unreal and you're going to get fatigued, yeah? Okay? At the bottom of that page, coverage rates, it gives you a rough idea. Now, if you look at the coverage rates on this one, just first call application for starters, on a nice smooth surface, 0 0.85 litres per square metre. Mm -hmm. But if you roll down three more below there, rough surface, 1.4. So, you know, you're nearly 30% up on coverage, which that. And that's why it says on our tins, anything from 7.4 to 10.6, because we don't know what your surface temp is. Okay, clicking over a page. This is your, uh, your fiberglass resin. And again, at the bottom of there, let's go for 100 square meter because it stands out more. 100 square meter on a smooth surface, you're going to use 135 litres. Yeah? On a rough surface at the end, 190 litres. That's the difference between the two. And that's why we don't put an actual coverage onto the, uh, to the pot. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> hardness, so you can see 7 litres. Never ever mix direct into the pot, decant it. If you put it into one of these tubs here, you get 7 litres in there, There's about 14 litres in that tub, break it down into the two, yeah? Mm -hmm. So do it half and half, and then that way you never put maybe more than 26 scoops into it. Because nothing worse than when you're actually measuring your scoops out, you know, one, two, three, somebody shouts you, what? Three. Oh fuck, where am I? How many you put in? I'm putting scoops in. Everybody shut the fucking mouth up because I got to say, right, 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 what do you want? Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, so it says on there percentages as well, 2%, 3%, 4%. We don't, I can guess percentage, you can't. Yeah, so we stick with litres, something you can see. You can see a litre, you can see the scoop, easy as that, yeah. Okay, clicking over page 21. 
Yeah, fiberglass mat. And you can see on this roof, they've actually laid it at 90 degrees roof, it's diagonal. Yeah, sorry, it's rectangular, horizontal to the roof rather than vertical. Don't matter which way you lay it, you can start at the bottom roof, work up, top of the roof, work down, don't matter. Because once it's done together and you've got your 50 mil lap, it becomes one piece, so there's no laps in it at all. Yeah. Okay, flicking over a page, resin application. So forget the top two pictures, sorry, top four pictures, we've done them, but the bottom two pictures, the one with the tick on, you all achieved that today, you all got achievements with early fibres. Yeah, we're not talking like curly, curly perm, we're just making them fibres go from straight to wavy. Yeah, if you look at the picture with the red X on and look at the bottom left hand corner, yeah, you still see white fiberglass in there. Mm. Not enough resin underneath. Very important, get resin underneath, bring it through. Once it's come through, more on top to consolidate with. Yeah, okay with that? Okay, and slip finishes, these are a bit old at, but we still do these. Yeah, if you still want to do this type of finish. What you do, you get to the stage you've got it now, you've got two coats on there, and then you put another coat of resin at half a litre per metre, and you sprinkle this into it, yeah? Let it go off, sweep the surface off, pack it in a bucket, and reuse it over and over again, until you've got none left, yeah? Now, if you're putting slate chippings on there, yeah, to make it look like a, a, a felt roof, why? Because you, you know, why do you want to make it look like a felt roof? It's not as fun. But if you want to put slate chippings on to make it anti-slip, yeah, you don't need any sealer on that at all, basically just slate chippings, walk away from it, sweep it off and leave it behind, yeah? Okay? If you're using quartz sand, which is the coloured stuff on top of it, you just need to seal the coat on top of it. It's a clear coat sealer just to seal it all in. And you can see straight away, a lot of work in that, resin down, sweeping off, moving through. So that's why we move forward to this one, because it's just a lot easier, it's, it's there. We do it in lots of different colours, including black and also the same colour as the resin, yeah? Okay? Flicking over the page, do's and don'ts. Yeah? Green bits you can do, red bits you don't. Okay? But if you look at the top of there, I mentioned this one earlier. You know, the four C's coverage, make sure you go for resin. Catalyst, make sure you go for catalyst to make it go off. Yeah? Consolidation, make all sure your fibers are curly. Yeah? And care, which is most important. Take a bit of care of what you're doing in a loose part. Yeah? If you rush through it and just bang, bang, wallop, wallop, you know, get paid by the client, it's going to go wrong. You can guarantee it. Never, never rush anything. Yeah? Today, everything's been for free. Today, we've taken a bit of care with it, we've taken the time with it, we've not pushed it through. Yeah. Time and, and uh, more experience will make it quicker for you. Yeah. First time you use it today, so you're probably a bit hesitant about it. But the more you use it, the easier it gets. Yeah. Okay. Red bits don't. Yeah. Okay. So there's lots of things on there, I'm not going to go through them all, but you know, if it's in red, consider it very carefully. Try and turn the red into green if you're all right. Okay. Clean your tools, you've done that today, yeah, back in the acetone every time, yeah. Buckets, a bit of stone in buckets, stack one for a minute or two, yeah. Repairs, see the repair done, this one. So that's got a top coat on now, but otherwise that's, that's done, repair. But that's a solid, there's bits around it, yeah. Just by putting a bit of tape and hand it on top of that, okay. Uh, day work joints, mentioned them on the rig when we did the corners, yeah. When you finish, uh, that edge off, so the next piece comes into it, yeah. Okay, first coat application, we've all done that, second coat application, we've all done that. Okay, page 26, troubleshooting, yeah. So these are the bits we do know go wrong, because we've been reported. If, if at all you, you're working on a job and you get some sort of defect with it and you're not 100% sure why it's happening, let us know about it, because if we need to know about it, it's going to be a common thing, you know, we'll, we'll get it in that troubleshooting, just to let people know. But the most common one, daft as it seems, is resin causing splashes on adjacent surfaces. Now you're working with a resin, yeah? you're working with a roller, and it's a windy day, so you might get splashes everywhere. Yeah? Best bet, you know, take a bit of care, mask off where you don't want it. If there's a car parked on the drive next door, ask them to shift it or at least cover it over. Yeah? Now if it's a brand new car, you might be really lucky. If it's well waxed and brand new, you might be just let it go off. Don't get down there and start picking at it. Let it go off, you might be got a plastic splash and flick it off if it's well waxed. If it's an old car, don't charge the client for the very fact that you've actually made a car that lasts 20 years longer. Okay? <laughs> okay, right. Uh, after installation, things that happen after installation. Let's go right in the middle again. Discoloration of the membrane. That's bitumen leaching, back of like primer. I mentioned that earlier. That's pollen migration, that's the bitumen coming through. Yeah? Okay, anything else on there? Surface so remains tacky after curing. Yeah, you're probably not putting enough catalyst in with it. Yeah. Think about what you're doing with it. Colour variation. Now you will get colour variations uh, if you buy 
lots of different batches. So all our resin is put together in a batch, and every bit of resin we do has got a batch number on it. Yeah. So when you're buying this, you'll try and buy the same batch, like buying wallpaper. Yeah. If you buy wallpaper, it might be the same pattern, but the ink might be slightly different. So you might get a differential on that one. The other reason you get differential in your colour, if you've done this bit in bright sunshine, it will actually cure quicker and it will actually have a shade difference in it. But it will level itself up, yeah? Not immediately, but it will level itself up over time, yeah? So don't tell the client not to worry that that a slightly shade darker grey than this shade, yeah? Okay, that's just the way it actually cures off quicker. Okay? To do data sheets. So on the back page of the book, the web address, if you need data sheets, yeah, for your cost assessments when you're doing that, or your health and safety risk plan or whatever you're going to do, yeah, they're there for that to use, yeah. Okay, performing a core test, you know, a core test basically, you go onto the roof, so again, I'm going to assess the roof, I'm going to climb on the roof, got my lad, blah, 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 tied up, I walked on the roof and I'm thinking, a bit spongy this, I'm going to tell the client, roof snacking, it's got to come off. So you go downstairs and you say, uh, yeah, I've been on your roof, I assessed it all, it's knackered, mate, it's just bouncing all over the place. You know, all your timbers are shot. And he looks at you like this, he goes, idiot, it's a concrete roof. <laughs> okay, so it's not bouncing, it's the fact that the insulation there has just gone all soft because it's soaking wet through. Yeah, if you've got soft insulation, wet insulation, really it's got to come off. Yeah, okay, don't trap moisture in there, take it all off, start all over again. Uh, the core test basically tells you that, so what you do, you're going to drill a hole into the roof with a core driller or hammer and chisel, bolt chisel, find, get right down to the substrate. That will tell you what the substrate is, it'll tell you whether there's a vapour control in there, it'll tell you what insulation's in there, which would be a different cork mat, the fibre boards, the ceramic boards, there's so many different, th different things in there. And then you finally get to the waterproofing, and you've got 23 layers of felt that it's built up and bunched up so many times. You know, if it's that bad, again, say to your client, how many times did I go this? Really, let's take it off, it's a good roof, it's a good building, take it off, let's start from your scratch, and I'll give you a 20 year warranty on it. Okay, performing an addition test, you saw that being done, after the one in, yeah. Okay, clicking over there, important notes on powder hardness, always stick to what it says on the pot, yeah. Low temperature applications, stick to what it says on the pots there, yeah. Let's go to the very back page, page 31, after 32, you'll be glad to know that this is nearly it. <laughs> okay, so what we built today guys is the bottom picture, which is the cold roof, yeah. Don't matter that it's insulated underneath, it's still called the cold roof. So if you've got a cold roof with the insulation underneath, that void has got to be vented. This morning I showed you how to vent it. You've got a gap at the back, soft vents over the top of the fiberglass, and they come out the back. Yeah? Okay. If you're building a warm roof, basically you've got your deck goes down there first, vapour control there, hard edge all the way around it so you've got something to fix to. Yeah? So your base there could just sheet apply. It's really bad if somebody's going to support it. I did a job in Liverpool uh, about four months ago actually. Yeah, just before Christmas. And they used 200 thick Celitex board foil face boards. And because the joists were so, the, the span was so long, the joists were only, uh, I think, they were about 250 apart. Mm. So they didn't even bother with a carrier board. Basically, just put the Celitex board straight to it. Went underneath that, the foil tape sailed it all up, stuff from migration, cold, cold bridging. Yeah. And then put the OSB board on top and just fix it through. Because there was enough support underneath it to stop the Celitex board squishing in. Yeah. But you don't have to use a, a PIR board, you can use a solid text, you can use a, uh, I don't know, you can use a, a styrofoam board. As long as it's got the right U value, yeah, carry a sheet, as long as it actually holds it in place and the V seal in place, yeah, and that's how you're working with it. Yeah. So don't spend a lot of money on OSB for your bottom board. Cheap shit for you, cheap mm -hmm. lights, all you need. Yeah. Okay, back page. Which is what you've all come for. You want your warranties, don't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Okay, right, so to apply for your warranties, once you actually finish your job and you're happy with it, yeah, you've got to get to, onto our web page, web page address is there, there, yeah. Go into a section called register your roof. So scroll down, find register your roof, put all the information you need into that, uh, into that page. Two pages generally, yeah, and it'll actually address the building, obviously, height of the building, picture of the roof, etc, etc. There's lots of questions on there. But the two main questions they'll ask you is what's your ID number? Now your ID number, your unique reference number will be on your training card when it comes to either a certificate or your little card. If you've asked, if you've asked for it electronically on your phone, it's there, you can actually, there it's got it. Okay? 
So it lasts for that. And the other thing is your batch numbers. So the batch numbers is on the catalyst, it's on the resin, it's on the fiberglass mat. And then the accessories such as these as well. Yeah. There's none on the trims because the trims are already pre-formed, they're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Now, if you've used 20 tins of resin, we don't want 20 batch numbers for resin. We just want one number because it is a batch of go. Just one number of resin, one number for the catalyst, one number for the map, and then anything else that's got batch numbers on it. Okay? And then once you've done that, fill it all in, send it off to us. We'll send it back to you as the installer, not to the client, but the address that's on there comes to you. Now, what you do with that is down to yourself. If your client's paid you, pin it to your invoice, give it, thank you very much. Yeah, where's your next job coming from? If he's not paid you and he says, I'm your warranty, pay me. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not paying to you, aren't you? All right, we've still made now, ain't it? <laughs> what do you want first? What's coming first, chicken or the egg? <laughs> you want your warranty? Pay me. If you made a shit job, it can probably not blame you for paying it. Most of our work that we put down fits to the standard you work with today, you'll have no problems with it at all. Like. But you've got to accept that the system is the system and it does work. If there's things going wrong, it's probably because you might have shortcutted it. Yeah. Most things that go wrong, no matter what it is, is down to human error. Yeah. Or computer setting up. Okay. So keep that in mind. Yeah. Because we have got a team of technicians at the yard again, they're available on the telephone number at the bottom of there. If you're struggling with anything, ring them up, and they'll actually answer all your questions. If you're not going to present sure about anything, ask the question. Don't struggle by. Don't think so. Yeah. I'll be near enough. Near enough is no way near enough. Yeah. Work to the best you possibly can. Yeah. Okay, fellas, that's it, we're all done. And as it happens, all your rigs have gone off. Yeah, it's like a fit okay. man. Yeah, so if you want your rigs, let me know. What we'll do is actually stand them up, take the screws out, and we'll demount them yeah. off the rig. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you're yeah. taking them with it. Honestly, I'd take them with them, you don't know them at all. Just stick them outside.